Hey, hey, I'm Ayuma Michelle and welcome to Let's with Ayuma here. This is an online safe space where I'm empowering progressive women from all around the world to thrive with purpose. Today, I'll be talking about fatherlessness on Father's Day with a message of hope, a message of hope, especially for the fatherless um, on Father's Day. And um, even before we get started, I'd just like to say thank you so much to all who've subscribed to this channel. Um, you've helped me reach my goal. I'd shared before that uh, my goal for June was reaching 100 subscribers. Thank you so much for helping me reach my goal. So please, let's continue together and help me reach my goal for this 2020, which is reaching 1,000 subscribers. Um, it really means a lot to get these messages that I share, these messages that I share as far and wide as possible because it's all about empowering you to thrive with purpose. So please hit on the subscribe button and let's keep journeying together towards our purpose and our greatest of success. So today is Father's Day. As you're watching this video, it's pre-recorded, but just know that today is Father's Day. And for many like me um, around the world, this day isn't an easy one to get through. And it's, you know, basically whenever people are celebrating Father's Day and stuff like that, it's, it's quite a very difficult day to go through. Whether because maybe you're fatherless, because, uh, because of fatherlessness, whether because maybe your dad is no longer in your life, or maybe because your dad is alive but just not in your life or hasn't been in your life, or, um, you know, or maybe your dad is around, you might even live in the same roof with your dad, but he's just not active he's not present in your life so fatherlessness looks so different in so many shapes and forms and so that's why for this particular day i wanted to share a spe special message of hope for you who struggles with this day it's not taking away from the day at all from those who have amazing loving present dads it's just that i'm providing alternative hopeful content and positive content for those of us who struggle with this day. Yes, I'm a coach, but I struggle with this day still, but I am working on, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a work in progress, right? So I'd like to share with you my experience as well as um, things that I've also worked done and a major decision that I did in my, that I made that completely changed my trajectory. And I hope that in the end, you find this to be so powerful so useful and that you realize there's still great hope even for you there's still great hope this day could literally mean a whole nother thing in your life that you no longer have to fear it okay despite the difficulties you no longer have to fear it but you could literally transform this day to mean something completely different for you positively different for you okay so yeah, the reason why this day is, 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 is quite difficult for me is because, um, you know, when I was born, um, the stories, you know, I, as I grew up, I, I'm quite inquisitive and curious. I always ask questions. So the people in my life, um, you know, have told me that when I was actually born, um, there was an expectation that I would be a boy. And so I even remember being told that even my grandmother, my dad's mom would come and stay with my mom and encourage her to have a son. But um, I started realizing growing up the frustration of me not having been a son, specifically from my dad. And I remember, you know, like I would work so hard just to get his attention. What it looked like when I was much younger, it was more like a withdrawal of affection. And also, of course, there was violence, those physical violence. And I really struggled to feel loved. I really struggled to get his attention and his affection. And for those of you who don't know that, that withdrawal of affection from a parent, that is actual emotional abuse, you know. And then obviously the violence, that is physical abuse. So it was quite abusive, but I didn't know because, you know, there's this very negative and toxic notion that African parents are supposed to be like that, that African dads are supposed to be stoic and they're supposed to be so... Um, so distant, you know, and less affectionate towards their children. But that is not right. That is not an African parent thing. That is abuse, you know. So I would work hard. I would try all manner of things just to get this man's attention, right? I would work so hard in school just so that I can get good, those good grades so that he can say, well done, you know. 
you have no idea the motivation a child can get just to get one good word of affirmation and affection from their parents. For me, I would work so hard. I would got to get those high grades. I remember I was very competitive um, in sports just so that I would always, I would not participate in a sport if I did not know, I would, if I wasn't sure that I was going to bring home a certificate or a medal. For me, not winning anything was not uh, an option because, you know, I was really motivated to get that well done, you know, from my dad. And I remember even in primary school, I would, I even topped the grades. I would become the best. I, I remember in um, my primary school, I was index four. That means you're the fourth top student in the school. And even despite that, it still wasn't good enough because I would work so hard just so that I can make him proud, just so that I can get that well done. But with time, I realized that no matter how hard I worked, you know, even with trying to make him look good, um, you know, not only with my good grades, but even my self-presentation. I remember there was a time I was, um, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was actually getting great grades. But despite me being an A student, I was still compared to his friend's daughter who performed better. So you see, there was always that constant, constant uh, competition, but always left feeling that it was never enough. So, and as I grew older, it now started shifting. The violence, the physical violence was no longer there, but then it shifted to things like verbal abuse, which was really, really serious. Like I remember one time literally just being in the car and being told, you know, whenever you people go for shopping, what are those things you buy? Because why aren't you dressing up like those other girls? You know, and for a teenage girl, I was still trying to figure out my, my fashion sense. And so being told by my own dad that, you know, why aren't you dressing up as good or as well as other girls, that really broke me, you know? And um, also, you know, things like, Things like even boys, I would never even talk about boys with him. But I realized that as I grew older, even the relation with boys, there would be a fear around it. Because I remember even in high school uh, being laughed at by my classmates because, you know, we were call pa our parents were called, you know, for, for a certain meeting. And during the meeting, my dad was like not defending me. In fact, he was talking about how I do things wrong, how I always do things wrong. And it took another girl's father to step in and protect me and tell me that I'm a teenager and I'm still exploring myself. So there's nothing wrong at all with what I'm doing. So I remember being laughed at by my classmates that, oh my goodness, your own dad does not, does not support you or does not defend you. You know, and for me, that was really heartbreaking because consistently, he constantly told me that Anytime anything goes wrong between me and my sisters, it was all, he always knew that it would be me. He always expected mistakes and all that stuff from me. So, but all these things started, it, it, it took a whole nother trajectory. I think when I grew much older and I was in university and I started looking for a job. And obviously because he's a journalist myself, I studied journalism. I thought that it would be so easy. You know, because, hey, you know, he wants me to do well. I mean, he's invested all that cash in my education. This is the point when he comes through and really, really supports me. But I remember struggling to even explain to him why I didn't get some jobs. And this is because every single media job that I went to, I was asked for sex. And I said no. And by saying no, I came home and I said I did not get the job and even before I could try to explain it, he was already like, you don't just, do, you don't do things right, you know? And even though I would try to explain to him some things, he would always be like, you're just not, you're just the one who's not doing things right. So imagine having an award-winning journalist as a dad and not being able to land a media job because of sexual harassment, left, right, and center, and him just not understanding that because I'm a, I'm a girl, you, you see? So it took other men, like my lecturer, I had another lecturer who literally rescued me from one of the most scary job interviews ever, which was I had gone for a job interview, a communications job. So after the media jobs just weren't working, I started looking for communications jobs. So I remember at the National Museums of Kenya, I went for an interview 
and there was this man the interview was supposed to be at 2 p.m but this guy kept dragging the interview till 5 p.m and i was like but 5 p.m are not working hours so i was a little bit patient and i was like okay maybe he's handling something but when 5 p.m reached he told me to come to his office and he started saying so what exactly are you looking for and stuff like that and i was like but you called me for a job interview at two what happened and so he started getting pissed off and started saying how ungrateful I am that he's even giving me any time and stuff like that. And so what he started doing, he became very aggressive and immediately, you know, women, you have that intuition about it's going to go down. Something is about to go down. And I remember running out of that room just in time before he locked me in his office. And I remember I was so scared and I took my phone and it was so heartbreaking that I couldn't call my dad. But I called my lecturer at that point. He's called Dr. Christopher Kisa. Thank you so much. And I'm going to also highlight the men who stood in the gap. Because it is important to know that even where our fathers aren't, pos aren't, aren't available, somehow it's like God provides us with these amazing angels who step in and they take us through these seasons, right? The fathers who walked with us. The fathers who chose us. So... They're stepping into that position. They're not necessarily our fathers, but they're stepping in. So I remember being so scared and calling Dr. Kisa on the phone and telling him that this is what happened. And I'm scared. And that, because that, and I told him that that man had actually threatened, because that time it's when I was looking for attachments in various organizations. Um, and he said that he's going to call the school and ruin my name and literally make sure that I don't get a job anywhere. And so he said that he was going to call the school and tell and, and re literally expose me and ruin my name so that I never get any kind of good grades or anything. So I told this to, to, to my lecturer and it was just so hard. It was just at that time, much as I was heartbroken, I'm so grateful that I had a man I could call and talk to about these issues and that he would walk with me through it. So he ended up advising me, told me to get out of that compound immediately. Um, and that he would help me look for other jobs. And he actually did. He ended up, you know, asking me to just rethink my, my, my whole career thing. Because I think he was the one lecturer who told me that, who gave me an idea that, especially for media students, women media students, the media is not, whatever we learn in class is not actually what plays out in the real world. There's a lot of sexism and a lot of sexual harassment. Media in Kenya, for you to be above 35 years of age and be a woman and especially a woman who even has a child that is literally you're a unicorn you're a unicorn because it is so sexist and the amount of harassment that happens is literally it's just illegal but i'm just so grateful that for this guy he did not he did not make me focus on what i didn't get but he helped me focus on what a new way of looking at my my skills and my career and i think by thinking that way that's how i was able to transform my communications skills and career into something that enabled me to now become a storyteller and a storytelling coach because it's backed by all of my training in media so you can obviously see that there was that struggle and i got a bit emotional there because this is a very emotional topic right so um I, I remember, though, that despite that being a very difficult moment, I realized that the most difficult moment was actually even when I, I ended up facing all manner of things. Because obviously it came to a point when I tried to look for jobs and these communications jobs and media jobs, they were just not what I was expecting. There was a lot of harassment. There was a lot of like very little pay or no pay. And I was like, why, why is it so difficult? But for me, I was like, it's so heartbreaking that I'm going through all of these difficulties, yet I have a whole award-winning father, a journalist for a father, and I can't get these connections, you know. And so it led me to a point where there was a time I said, okay, let me get into business. But I thought this would be something amazing because even my mom had supported me, invested in me getting some skills on the side. Those of you who don't know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a certified event planner. So I tried all manner of things so that I can explore how else can I serve, how else can I repurpose my skills. And I remember 
literally two, 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 two major events that literally told me that I will never get that back. I will never get what I needed um, from this guy because he's in another, he's in another realm. So number one was when there's a time I was working late and stuff like that. And I came home from one of the jobs that I got, one of the communications job that I got and I came home and it was so heartbreaking that my own dad suspected that I was having some kind of relations. It, 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 this is a consistent narrative that I'd had ever since I was a teenager. I didn't mention it in my teenage phase. But there was this consistent narrative where my dad always likened me to a woman who was searching, you know, for love from other people, from men and stuff like that. Um, so it was so heartbreaking that I came home late from working on this job because... Obviously, I was being underpaid, but I had to work hard as a black woman in this international organization just so that people can be like, okay, she can keep her job or okay, yeah, she's actually working. So I came home at 9 p.m. and he came home at the same time. And when I was paying the taxi driver, I came home and I was being confronted with the question, why were you kissing the taxi driver? You get what I mean? So things like those always being looked at as a prostitute by your own dad, in other words. So um, that was very heartbreaking. But the second part is was when I was starting my business, when I was launching as an entrepreneur. Um, and it was so difficult because when I expected to receive all the love and the support that I needed, what I got from him one time was that he actually told me that no matter how hard I try, he's just waiting for me to fail that he's just waiting for the next month to come because he knows that I will fail. And again, this is him as an entrepreneur who's done amazing projects across the globe. Some of these projects have even gotten aired on primetime CNN. And I'm being told that I will fail. So I literally battled with that because I was like, why am I never enough? Why am I never good enough? Why am I, why do I look like trouble in your eyes? For once, why can't I look like a daughter? Why can't I be embraced? Why can't I be loved? Why can't I be praised? And I guess this is part of the reason why I am type A with my work, with everything that I do, not to prove a point to him or to any other people, but to prove to myself, the inner child in me needs praise. The inner child in me I realized was deficient in praise, was deficient in affirmation, was deficient in, 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 in um, what is it called? Affirmative words and affirmative thoughts. And so I needed to provide that for myself, if that, if that makes sense. So until I reached to a point where I was like, what's wrong with me? Or what, what made him this way? And it took my grandfather passing, my late grandfather passing, for me to realize or to start to have an understanding as to what was actually happening. You see, as I'd mentioned in my previous video, my dad grew up in a family where there was hate and PTSD. And this is because his father was kidnapped by British soldiers, taken to Burma, fight World War II, after that, he was dumped back into the country to self-manage. There was no psychological support. There was nothing. And so this is a man who used to be a simple young farmer providing for his family. But coming back from the war, he came back a machine because he was trained to kill. And so here comes a father being introduced into a family with PTSD from active war without any help, no psychological support, nothing. And so my dad was the eldest son and he learned very quickly to become the man of the house. He had to protect himself, his siblings and his mother because his father was sick. He had serious PTSD and he was very violent. It reached a point where my grandfather had to flee to Uganda for the sake of his own life and for the sake of his family's life so that he could stay there he started a business a roadworks business in uganda to provide for his family from there 
And you see, this is literally being robbed because of the war and the PTSD and all of that. That literally robbed this family from a father figure. And obviously, because of all of the damage that was done, my dad had to rise up and become the father of the home. This is a probably a child. You're still a child. But imagine being forced to become a father of a home without knowing how to do so and having to deal with all the PTSD that has happened, the effects of PTSD in the family. And so he literally became a father figure of the home, not necessarily for thriving, but to survive. This was during the colonial times in Kenya. The, he was learning how to do that for the survival of his family. And when you're thinking survival, you aren't thinking about those things like emotional and stuff like that. And so that is how I got to understand the how of my dad. How did I get to be this person? But also how did my dad get to be this person that he is? And how did his father get to be the person that he was? And so because of this PTSD, I started realizing that there are generational effects of PTSD in my family, even with my uncles. Later on, my uncles ended up getting jobs as, uh, um, you know, in the army. I don't know. There was a time where in Kenya, when you, I think when you finished either university or high school or something, you had to go through like military training or something. So my uncles went through military training and stuff. And obviously that added on top of all of the PTSD that they'd gone through. And so that's when I started as a grown up now, when I look back, I'm seeing that there's a trail of fatherlessness in my family because in my extended family, because I am seeing that these, they're just men. They were soldiers who never got the psychological support that they needed, but also they were fathers who were robbed from families and they were forced to, to, to reintegrate into the, the community as unhealed people yet being expected to act and show up as healed people. And so obviously being a child surrounded around that, you ended up getting affected you know, by it. And so that's when I realized, yo, I see the fatherlessness. I see the men who are either they died or walked away or, or who are not present with their children. That's the current situation, especially with my father's family. But also, I also see it at a larger scale as a black woman, because I realized there's a huge issue of fatherlessness in many black communities around the world because of war, because of the aftermath of wars, whether it's in Africa or even in the US, I see there's a war that many black men had been, have been fighting for generations. And because of these effects of war, the men have serious PTSD and they aren't able to show up as heel hold men um, to their families. And people don't realize that there's also murder. There's a huge thing of murder of black men. So when you kill a man, you literally, you've taken a man from a family George Floyd and also the men who are you know who are kidnapped from their families to fight wars they never started you know and there was also the, there's the fact there's the issue of incarceration all over the world of black people especially in the US where they, there are systems that intentionally incarcerate black and latino men and they don't realize that as you're taking away these men you're taking them away from their families that need fathers that need husbands that need father figures you see and also the fact that those, the men who are not incarcerated or murdered or um, dealing with the wars within them, the wars that never left them, you know, these, these, this whole issue of black men having to work hard 10 times more, if not 100 times more, just to provide for their families, working so hard like donkeys for peanuts, and by these black fathers having to work hard 10 times more than maybe their, their white counterparts, this, takes, this is stealing time, memories, moments away from their families, you know? So men having, black men having to toil so hard, sweat, stay in those offices late night, you know? Not being able to engage with their kids because they're constantly thinking about how to provide. That takes away men from their families as emotion, the emotional presence, right? So I just wanted you to understand how, from my own family, an example, how this plays out from a family unit to an extended family unit to even a, a community unit. 
a community which is the black community globally. So I hope it also allows you to see that there's a systemic issue all around the world in our communities and our families that is taking away black men from being able to show up present and healed in their own families and communities. So one day in my story, uh, one day everything changed for me. You see, I was talking to my mom about love and relationships. My mom is always curious. I've always been very private with my relationship life. And it's because I struggled. I struggle a lot to, 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 to connect with the men that I date. How do I talk to these men about the, 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 the fatherless issue that I always had? How do I... I struggle. I always struggle to connect because I always feel like I'm not good enough. So I always feel like this. I'm always ready to jump out. If that makes sense. I'm always ready to jump out because I'm always like, okay, at some point this guy is going to be like, oh, you're not good enough. So it's like, I always struggle with that. I always struggle with accepting affection and accepting that love. So, um, and accepting to be taken care of. And it's something that till today I am working on. I've become way better at it, but it's something that I honestly acknowledge I have struggled with. So one day I was talking to my mom about love and relationships and dating. You know, my mom is at that age where she's looking for grandchildren. She's praying for grandchildren. <laughs> so which I believe it will come to pass, but I need to work on my healing first, you know. And so I was talking to her about that. And then she asked me one question that took me by surprise. She was like, no man has ever told you he loves you. And it took me aback. And I was like, mom, no. No man has actually ever told me he loves me. But I took another step back where I was like, yo. Men that I've dated and stuff like that. Fine, they've never told me he loves me. But not even my own dad. My own father has never told me that he loves me. And when I went to bed that night, I tell you, I cried. I cried. Like, I seriously cried till my pillow got soaked up. Till today, it even has a stain of my tears. But I, I just cried because I was like, oh my goodness. No single man, in, but most importantly, my dad. Has ever told me that he loves me. I felt so broken. I felt so ashamed. I felt so unworthy. I think that that has got to be one of my, my, my lowest moments in my life. But I realized I did one thing. One thing changed the trajectory of that, of that moment. I, you know, when you, when you cry till tears can't come out anymore, I ended up just getting to a point where I just talked to God. And I told God, God, in your word, you say that you're the father to the fatherless. I realized that I'm a fatherless woman. I'm a fatherless girl. And I've tried all that I can. I have tried to build a great career, do amazing work. I've tried to be an A-game student. I've tried to be a top athlete. I've tried to do all of that. But still, I realize that I have been walking in a wilderness of life as a woman who's, un, who's not covered. I know that my father is not able to be the father that I need him to be. In fact, I believe, I remember telling God, these are the actual words I was telling God. These I was talking to him and I was telling him, in fact, God, I realize that my father needs you more than I need him. But as you work on him, are you willing to step in and be my dad? Because I know that I am a fatherless daughter, but are you able to step in and be my dad? Because I need a father. I am growing up as a woman and I'm seeing how I'm showing up in various areas of my life, especially love and relationship. I desire, I was once telling myself that I don't need a family. I don't need to, to, to get married. I don't need a man in my life for me to be enough. But I realized that all along, I desired that. I desire a family. I desire a beautiful, healthy marriage, lasting, passionate marriage. But I realize that I am struggling to connect and to build that because something in me is broken. Are you willing to fix me? Are you willing to father me back to health? Are you willing to be my dad? And I think I, I went to sleep. I think I just said that and I went to bed. But I remember 
The next day when I woke up, something had shifted in me. I felt lighter. And I don't know how else to explain it, but I felt like God was like, I got you. You asked, and here I am showing up for you. And I remember one time, I was actually going for a women's meetup because I normally host some women's meetups. So I normally wake up quite early because I live out of the city, out of Nairobi. And I went, I went, I was using public transport. So I entered this, this, this bus. And I remember consistently feeling like I had left something. Because before I always used to feel like I was carrying something. But this time around, I, constant, I consistently remember distinctively that time I felt like I had left something at home. I felt like I was lighter. I was carrying the same bag. I was carrying the same contents in my bag. But I felt like I had left something. But by the time I reached Nairobi, because I was having all of these thoughts and um, conversations with God in my mind, until it clicked, it's because I was walking as a lighter woman. The burden of fatherlessness I had been carrying was no longer, I was no longer carrying it. And so I felt like I had left something home. I felt like I was, I had, I, my, my, my bag was lighter in fact. And, but it's because my spirit was lighter. It's because my mind was lighter. I had cast that burden before God and I had told him, please take charge. That's why I was feeling lighter. And people don't realize this, but the spiritual battles you fight, they manifest physically. And they manifest also emotionally. So this time I was lit physically feeling lighter, like I was carrying less things because my spirit was lighter. I had cast away that burden. I had let go of that burden before God. And for real, he had my back. And so I realized that at some point, I realized that even though I had worked so hard on myself, you know, gone and done all manner of things, to work on myself because realize healing is your responsibility it's no one's responsibility no matter what you have gone through in your life no matter how hard and terrible and traumatic it might be healing is in your hands because you can't receive healing from a doctor until you realize you're sick you go to hospital you say you tell this doctor these are my symptoms and I need healing I am willing to pay for it I am willing to put the sweat capital in it so that I receive healing it's the same with even God. He won't come and just heal you just like that. You must be able, remember even in the Bible when Jesus was about to heal people, he would ask them, do you want to be healed? You see, do you want it? You need to get to a point where you want that healing, that you ask for it and that you're willing to do the work to get it. And this is where the real work begins, guys. It does not come easy. I have found myself in very dark places looking for my father. Very dark places. I have found myself in an abusive um, friendship with a guy chasing my father. I have found myself in arguments with men. Literally, there's a time I sat down with a, with, with a guy friend of mine. And this guy friend told, I told him, yo, what's happening? Like, there's a time I used to have many guy friends. Why have these guy friends gone quiet? And he told me, Michelle, you are very angry. And when you're angry, we make, you make us feel like we've done something that you, we, you make us feel like you're punishing us for something we have not done. And I realized, oh my gosh, it's like I was punishing the men around me for the mistakes of my dad, for the hurt that my dad had made me experience. And so that's when one moment I woke up and I realized I had no male, male friends around me because I had chased them away with my anger. And much as you can understand where the anger comes from, I also needed to learn how to self-manage. I needed to learn how to manage all the pain, the anger, the frustration that I was feeling. Because for how long was I going to walk in that wilderness as an uncovered and healed woman? I needed to work on themselves. And so by when God stepped in, I also needed to do the work of building, actively building a relationship with God as my father. That means praying and waiting to listen from him. 
reading his word because that is his manual. That's how you can discover who he is. Surrounding myself with godly friends who have, who have healed stories. But also God challenged me to do something. Much as I grew up in a family where the men were not present. I grew up from a family with a serious case of fatherlessness, guys. Like literally, there's no single one relationship or marriage in our family that I can call a good example. There's no stable or healthy marriage in our entire extended family that I can actually say that's an example. So this one, God took an extraordinary measure and I felt led to reach out to men, realize that it's due to this encounter and relationship that I was building with God that I got to start experiencing and learning what the character of a good father is from God himself. And because I became acquainted with these particular characters, he then, when he then led me to seek examples and accountability partners around me, I then knew what characteristics I was looking for, right? So I reached out to men in my fam in, in within the around me. There's one who till today is keeping me accountable with my mental health, helping me prox process and work on all of the toxicity that I grew up around and PTSD. And it's because he himself had worked on his healing. God led me to men who had taken charge of their stories and were working on their healing. That's another thing. We can no longer say that, oh, let's say I am a, I grew up around a dad who's violent, so that means any man. I can no longer give an excuse to the hurt that I inflict onto other people's lives. It reaches a point where when you hurt, you hurt other people. And you need to take responsibility of that part. You can't control what happened to you, but you can control how you show up and respond to people around you. So for me, I decided to reach out to men who actively are working on their healing. And so one of them worked, worked on his healing with mental health. Another one worked on his healing as a fatherless son. And so right now he's fathering a daughter. And so these men are now working with me. You know, Victor and Dennis, thank you so much for working with me. Um, you're not my dads, but thank you for filling in those shoes, how you cooled and when you cooled. And I decided to desire for myself what I've always wanted, which is a beautiful new legacy with whole, a whole healed family. And this is serious because how can I desire something I've never had? How can I create something I've never had? That's where God steps in. So yes, there was God mentoring me and stepping in. But there's also God leading me to men who worked on their healing so that I can have these positive examples around me. But there's also working on myself so that when that healed man out there who God has for me sees me, he will also see a woman who's worked on her healing so that together we can create and build a new generational legacy of a healed family. It does not matter what happened to us in our past, but it is because of what happened to us in our past, we worked on our healing and therefore present ourselves as healed parents to our future kids, healed partners in each other's life. That's what I am working on now. You can only desire what you have also worked on, your, on yourself. You desire love when you yourself have love in abundance with yourself, which takes me to my dream. I needed to liberate my mind. That's the thing. I needed to liberate my mind. I needed to liberate my mind from fatherlessness and take charge of my new legacy. Because guess what? I, am, I, I feel like God is preparing me to be a first generation godly marriage in my family. In my family, there's no single godly marriage. So I feel God is preparing me for that. That's why this to me is a big deal. And so I had a dream once where I was seated in a room. And you guys, those of, of you who don't know, I am a, I'm actually a dreamer. The things that I dream sometimes and remember they are connected to a future, a, a real future that's coming, that's coming forth. And so in this dream, I was seated somewhere. And on the floor, there was my, my husband and my child. They were playing together. And my dad in his old age was seated there watching them. And that at that point, that's when it clicked to my dad that that is what my daughter needed all along. 
and that at the same time feeling the relief that even though he wasn't there he even though he did not provide that that still the legacy was restored that's what i'm praying over my life and i and i'm working towards that that's why family for me is a huge deal i am praying that one day even though and realize it's not only just for my child or my husband but it's also that if god grants my dad life at that time when it happens he will get to see it and realize that even though he did not get it right i did and i worked on myself so that my grand my child his grandchild gets to experience that which is why i'm sharing with you that it takes a village to raise healed people for me it took me a village of fathers from school to sometimes my workplace to even my friendship circles men who are literally my age but because they've worked on healing for themselves they are able to step in and give me that positive example i have a village of fathers and that's why on this fathers day i'm inviting you to recreate a beautiful new narrative and legacy for yourself because healing is in your hands until you decide that you want to get healed only then will you start to experience healing but realize that in today's world which is so broken where fatherlessness is a human crisis you need to do extraordinary things like for me reaching out to god himself as the father of the fatherless to step in and teach me and mentor me but also to create a village of fathers reach out to a village of fathers of men who worked on their healing so that i can consistently reprogram myself with experiences of healed fatherhood stories and healed men but also the fact that realize that there are many men out there we've borrowed fathers and i'm so grateful that these men allowed me and the women in their lives allowed me to to borrow their fathers to borrow their husbands to borrow their their sons so that they can help me fill those gaps that were left open that void that was left open um through fatherlessness and so that's why today i i celebrate all fathers who've been present who are he, who worked on their healing and who are providing those great examples but also i i want to celebrate all of the the borrowed fathers the village of fathers who allow us to borrow them and to learn how to show up as healed women healed people healed grown children in this life thank you for willing to partner with us for our legacies thank you for being our legacy partners thank you so much other people are celebrating their actual dads for many of us we will need to start celebrating our village of fathers they are there they are truly there and i'm so grateful for any man who stepped into a shoe of a borrowed father thank you so much thank you so much it's because of you that we have hope of beautiful new legacies of our own and of acknowledging men just like you who together with them we can create new legacies but also i'd like to share with you something i was talking to my little sister yesterday and we were talking about love and we learned that love is a source love is a source and once you start seeing yourself as a source of love you'll realize it is not transactional you will love because you have love within yourself and that's how god manages to love us even with all our wretchedness and so i'm going to do something different this fathers day i'm going to not only start celebrating my village of fathers but also i'm going to reach out to my own father with a message of love to thank him for being the father that he was for doing the things that he did right even though they may be few i'm still going to reach out to him with a message of thank you of gratitude to thank him for what he did right what he did right the best he knew how to the best he could when he could and accept that that is the best that he could give me sometimes that's what we have to come to accept that the people who hurt you 
they could only love you the best that they could, the, the best they knew how to, and when they could. And so I'm going to share this message because remember, my dream does not just involve my, my child and my husband. It also includes my dad. And I need him to be there. And I need to shepherd this relationship that will enable him to feel welcome around me in order for him to witness a restored generational legacy. I'd like to, if you feel like you've gotten to that point of healing where you can actually do that, please go ahead and do it. Whether they read the message, whether they don't read the message, whether they respond or not, realize you're a source of love. And your responsibility as a source of love is to love. That's it. Not to expect it, but it's to love because you are a source. So that's all for today. And I just pray for each one of you who's watching this video that may you take charge of your legacy and may you get to live experience and lead a healed legacy. Happy Father's Day to you. Happy Father's Day to all of the village of men in your life, the borrowed fathers in your life, and happy future, future Father's Day to all of the amazing men that we are going to birth into this world and that we are going to partner with as our legacy partners. Happy Father's Day to you all, and may we all get to experience beautiful, healed legacies. That's all for today. Remember to like, comment, and to subscribe. Comment below and let me know what are you planning to do differently this Father's Day. Whatever it may be. It could even be a prayer. Comment below. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. This is Let's With Ayuma, where I'm empowering progressive women from all around the world to thrive with purpose. And indeed, to thrive with shall, with new legacies. Bye-bye.